welcome. My name is Philip Ivanov. I'm the CEO of Asia Society Australia. Asia Society is delighted to be partnering with the Alliance for Journalist Freedom to bring you today's public event reporting on China. Before we begin, uh, I acknowledge that many participants in today's event are dialing in from locations that have traditional owners and custodians. Today I'm speaking to you from Melbourne, the land of Boon Wurrung and Wurrungjeri peoples of the East Kulin Nation. I acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to welcome and acknowledge any Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander and First Nations people joining our webcast today. Australia's relationship with China is under immense pressure. Some of that pressure is a part of the global trend as the world grapples with more powerful, more global and more assertive and sometimes less tolerant China. Some of it is bilateral, as Australia, as one of our diplomats put it, is negotiating the new boundaries of our relationship with China. And the recent departure of our last remaining in-country Australian journalist has not only damaged diplomatic relations, but it has also brought into question Australia's ability to remain informed on China, its people, its government, its society, at a time when there is a China angle in most of our critical policy, economic, as well as social issues. Of course, this story is bigger than journalism. It's also bigger than Australia. But journalism plays a, a, an important part in how our community views and interprets China. Today, we are very honored to be joined by an expert panel of media professionals to discuss the complexity of reporting on China and in China and why we need that reporting now more than ever. Uh, before I pass over to my esteemed co-host, uh, let me quickly go through today's proceedings. Today's event will run for around 45 minutes with 25 minutes for our panel discussion and 15 minutes for audience Q&A. So please have your questions ready. Uh, please submit your question at any time in the YouTube live chat box, which is located in the right hand of your feed and we will share it with our panel. For further background on the incredible expertise of our speakers today, please be sure to follow the link that we are going to share with you on YouTube. Uh, it's now my great pleasure to introduce our partner and moderator for this event, Professor Peter Greste. Peter, as you know, is uh, an award-winning foreign correspondent who spent 25 years working for BBC, Reuters and Al Jazeera in some of the world's most volatile places. He reported from the front lines of Afghanistan, Latin America, Africa, the Middle East and beyond. And he's best known for becoming a headline himself when he and two of his colleagues were arrested in Cairo while working for Al Jazeera. He has since become a vocal campaigner and advocate for media freedom and founded the Alliance for Journalist Freedom. Peter, I want to thank you and your team at the AJF for partnering with us on this program. It's a timely and important discussion, which I'm very much looking forward to. Over to you. Well, thanks very much for that introduction. Can I say how wonderful it is to be the moderator for this conversation that's not only very topical, but frankly also very important. Just yesterday, the BBC ran a story about how Australia-China relations have hit their lowest ebb since 1972. Now, the story went on to outline a host of factors that got us into this current mess, but it seems to me that whatever the geopolitical reasons that lie behind it, the crisis is exacerbated by a chronic gap in understanding. Of course, that's what foreign correspondents are supposed to help with, to tell the stories of the countries they're covering with empathy and insight in ways that might narrow that gap just a little. It's what our three panelists have all been doing with remarkable skill and dedication over the years, particularly in covering China, it's also why recent forced departure of the last two correspondents working for Australian news organisations is, in my view, so tragic. Uh, we'll learn more about our panellists as we go through the conversation. We can read about them or you can read more detailed biographies on the Asia Society and AJF websites. But let me introduce them briefly now. We have from the past, Melissa Chan, who used to cover China in tw until 2012. She's an Emmy-nominated journalist based in Beijing, but she also spends a lot of time reporting on China's influence from beyond its borders. We have Su Lin Wong, who represents in some respects the future. She's now the Economist's China correspondent, 
currently based in Hong Kong and applying for a visa for mainland China. And Mike Smith is, I suppose, the closest thing we have to the present <laughs> is from the Financial Review and one of those two reporters who left the country last month. So Mike, let's begin with you, given that your story is the one that has really triggered this event. I'm wondering if you could just briefly open the conversation by reminding us of what happened to you and your colleague, Bill Bertels. Yeah, thanks, Peter. As looks, some people here might be aware, uh, sort of very late in August, um, Bill Bertels and myself were, were informed by the Australian government that, uh, that we should seriously think about leaving China. This uh, coincided with uh, news that uh, another Australian journalist, Chung Lei, had been detained uh, several weeks earlier. So look, it, it took a couple of days for this sort of uh, warning to sort of digest. We booked air tickets out of the country. So look, the, the night after we booked those air tickets, both of us received a midnight visit from uh, from China's secret police, the Public, Public Security Bureau. You know, I had seven officers turn up in my house sort of in the middle of the night. Um, they informed me that I was a, a person of interest in the investigation into Chung Lei and a travel ban had been put on me so I, so I couldn't leave China. So look, obviously this was pretty disturbing uh, stuff. Yeah, this had never happened to a foreign correspondent in China before, a, a, an exit ban uh, being, being put on them. So look, the Australian government uh, reacted pretty swiftly. They took a very cautious approach. They uh, put uh, Bill and myself under consular protection. Uh, we were there for five days. Uh, meanwhile, the Australian and Chinese governments actually sort of negotiated a deal uh, that would allow us to leave China, but uh, only on the, the proviso uh, that we submitted to an interview from the, the Ministry of State Security about this Chung Lei investigation. Look, in the end, China kept its word. Uh, we were allowed to leave, but it was a, it was a very fraught um, week, as you could imagine. We just didn't really know until we got on the plane uh, whether we'd be, be allowed to leave or not, whether we'd be detained or not. Mike, I'm just wondering, you mentioned Chung Lei a lot, and I think we'll, we'll come to we'll talk to her mm -hmm. a little bit about her in, in, uh, in a few moments, but we also learned subsequently um, that ASIO had raided some Chinese journalists and, and academics here in Australia um, just before your, your, your incident. Do you think those two incidents are connected? Look, it appears they were linked. Now, we didn't know about the ASIO raids when we were still in China. That information was made public by the Chinese media the, the day after we uh, got back. But um, look, it, it seems pretty obvious that, um, you know, China works on a tit-for-tat basis. If, if they, they believe Australia's roughing up their journalists, they probably wouldn't hesitate to, to rough up Australia's journalists. The, the thing about all this is we still don't really know. We don't really know why, why Chung Lei has been detained. Um, you know, we don't really know why we were treated the way we were. But um, look, it, it seems pretty obvious to, to, to link the, the two. And, um, you know, there's still a question mark over why these Chinese journalists were, you know, why their homes were raided at, at dawn as well. We, you know, we still don't really know, you know, what, what they're meant to have done either. So then, does this lack of transparency, the lack of understanding about what really motivated the, the, the pressure on, on Mike and Bill, um, does that concern you as someone who is, is working, well, in, in Hong Kong, but also hoping to work in China? Yes, definitely. I think um, the way this political situation has evolved, uh, particularly over this past year, has been very concerning for foreign correspondents in China or uh, foreign correspondents who are hoping to go to China. Um, I mean, there are still hundreds of foreign correspondents reporting on the ground in mainland China. Um, there are Australians, Americans, um, Europeans, people from all over the world. But obviously, uh, recent developments have been very, very concerning to us as a community. How do you, does it change the way that you approach your reporting? Does it, do, do you self-censor in any way being, I mean, you must obviously have, have those, those sorts of incidents in the back of your mind whenever you're doing sensitive stories. Uh, I personally don't self-censor. I'm currently in Hong Kong, um, so there are certain stories um, that are very hard for me to report because 
so much of journalism, as you know, is about being on the ground and going to the villages and um, going to parts of China that um, we think are important to write about, um, but are quite inaccessible unless you physically go there in person. So there are obviously certain stories I cannot do right now uh, from Hong Kong, but I, I wouldn't say I'm self-censoring. I mean, that having been said, I can't speak on behalf of all foreign correspondents in China. Um, and a few years back, um, there was a big scandal at Bloomberg where um, a couple of Bloomberg journalists resigned after they felt like Bloomberg had um, killed their reporting on China um, because of um, censorship considerations. Melissa, I know when we spoke, you I, I asked you that question about self-censorship and you put it in a slightly different way. Do you want to yeah. Yeah, I'd push back a little bit on what Suleen says about not self-censoring. I do think all journalists make a calculation in terms of the story that they decide to report on. So um, I, I, I would be very interested if there was ever a case of a journalist that got a visa to China and the first story they did was on Tibet or on something that's very third rail in terms of human rights, right? So I do think we make all these calculations and I don't necessarily think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think the, the self-censorship itself, that that term itself just sort of freaks people out and, and it's just got so many negative connotations, but we all make calculations. And there is a reason why um, there's been a tradition uh, when journalists who've been based in China for many years are exiting of their own free will and as planned, that you tend to see that the last few stories are, are kind of like hard hitting human rights ones. And there's always been a joke. And I remember when I first got to China, you know, you, you meet those uh, foreign correspondents who are exiting that, you know, do, do the big splashes um, that they've sort of held back on. So it's a calculus and I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing, right? Um, so I, I, I do think that that's something that we should acknowledge. I think there's a difference between self-censorship in the sense of like story selection versus like if you have decided to do a story and the actual contents of the article you, you, you decide to withhold. That, that is different. And I, I do think there, there is a difference in that. Um, so, yeah. so yeah, that's kind you, of you my view of self-censorship. You described it as picking your battles, I think. Yeah, I mean, you do pick your battles, right? Um, I'll say that because I, so my, my expulsion departure was really complicated and just to really um, shorten it, I, I was put on a tight leash, essentially a short leash. Um, and they gave me short term visas after I'd been there for many years and had the regular visas that you get, which is an annual renewal. Um, and so that was sending a message. And for a while, I mean, I, I remember most frustratingly uh, at the start of the year um, in 2012, there were these village elections in the south of China in Guangdong province that a lot of journalists, foreign correspondents were covering because it was so unusual. It's kind of like a little mini rebellion that was going on there. And a decision was made that I uh, would not go down there. And that was self-censorship. It was extremely frustrating. But, you know, at the time, my access to China was in peril. So you make the calculus well, there are so many other journalists covering that. Um, so it's not as if it's a story that no one is covering. And we are in this really delicate situation with the Chinese foreign ministry, where Al Jazeera at the time was of course trying to engage with the Chinese to try to find out uh, what it was they were unhappy with and try to start a dialogue and to resolve the issue to allow me to keep reporting. And you can see that the value of, uh, of if the fact that they were able to engage with the Chinese successfully that, it would, that I would have stayed on, how many more stories I would have done in China as a result. So that was a calculated decision. But, you know, later on, as it became clear, and it was frustrating, right? And as it became clear that, um, I think the dialogue wasn't going very well. You know, I, I really did feel regret about, you know, not going down there and it's frustrating. And so during my last month in China, I kind of decided to say to hell with it, you know, and I didn't know this was going to be the outcome that I would be expelled. But, you know, I did decide to do some big um, human rights stories, including one on extra legal detention centers and another one in which I had a confrontation with state police um, trying to interview one of China's more uh, better known rights lawyers. So 
you know, I think about the self-censorship thing a lot, and I think journalists like to say they don't self-censor, but we all make calculuses. And again, I go back to, you find me the journalist that gets into China, and the first story they do is on Tibet, and then, you know, we can have a real conversation about that sort of metric. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, Su Lin, you, you've, you, well, Su Lin mentioned earlier on, we, it's not as if there are no Australians covering China. Um, there are quite a few uh, who are covering them, but for other organizations, not for Australian news organizations. Mike, you're, you're in a difficult position of having to now, well, technically, I, I think you're still China correspondent. Do you see you're going to be able to cover China from, from Sydney? Yeah, it's a really good question, and it's, and it's a huge dilemma. Um, look, there, there's a lot of American journalists, you know, the guys from Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and I think they're posed with the, with the same problem at the moment. And obviously, you can't cover China as well if you're not there, if you're not on the ground. Um, you know, sure, reporting has been getting tougher and tougher in China over the last 18 months, but um, just being on the ground and, and having those random conversations with, with people when you're out on road trips and, um, and, and all the nuances that, that come with it. So look, it's very difficult. It's a huge question that, um, that we here at the Australian Financial Review are asking ourselves at the moment. Um, you know, you, you can cover it, obviously, to, to, a, to a limited extent. I mean, I guess you don't have to worry about censoring yourself uh, in many ways, but, um, you know, it's really difficult not being there. You just, the, you know, the only information you're get, getting is the daily foreign ministry briefings where they're, food, you know, spoon feeding you sort of government propaganda. So beyond that, it's sort of, it is very difficult and it's a real problem. Melissa, you've had a bit of value of, of time to really get a sense of how distance changes the way that you think about China. I'm wondering if you could just explain how your attitude of the, or your view of the country has changed. And I must I must remind our audience, I'm sorry, I, I believe I may have mentioned that, or said that you were based in Beijing. You're, of course, based in Berlin at the moment, but uh, you, you, were, you were based in Beijing for, for, for many years. Yeah, I, I think one of the hardest things is that you don't really have access to talking to people in China, right? And so if I want to continue covering China in some ways, and frankly, I took a quite a long break after I left China and just was exploring other reporting beats, including in my own country in the United States. Um, and I kind of returned to looking at China when it became clear to me that um, it was going to be, uh, was going to have a huge impact around the world in every single country. Um, but inevitably what ended up happening and what has happened is that um, because you don't have access to people on the ground, a lot of the stories that I do are related more to foreign policy, more to defense and security. And um, I, I mean, I'm perfectly aware that I come across a lot of people think that I'm rather hawkish uh, on my views on China. And I think it's, in part because of the fact of the beats that I am able to cover, it would be fundamentally different if I had access to the country. And for those who do remember my time in China from 2007 and 2012, they do remember the, the stories that I covered that was not related to national security and foreign policy and was about the people. So Lynn, um, we've seen a, a peer research study released recently that shows that favorable views of China have tanked in the past few years. In Australia, I think it now sits at 15% who have a favorable view of the country. The unfavorable score is a rather staggering 81%. That's amongst the worst in the world. Do you think China really cares about the way the rest of the world sees it? Certainly the, the recent events with Mike and, and Bill aren't gonna improve that, 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 that view. Well, I guess it's uh, very hard to know what the Chinese Communist Party is thinking. Um, but I, I think um, China is in growing increasingly confident and um, aggressive in terms of its foreign policy. And we've seen quite a distinct shift from um, the way China would handle its relations with other countries, um, you know, a decade ago or even a few years ago. Um, so, so that indicates to me that um, China is um, less worried um, than it used to be about how the rest of the world uh, perceives it. 
then they're not looking at the at the pure research and thinking we've got to do something to buff up buff up our image um well actually I, I believe this question was put to um one of the wall street journal correspondents who, who very closely um follows elite chinese politics ling ling way and has has uh, much better insights into um the mind of xi jinping than i do but i think she was speculating that it's possible that the peer results weren't even shown um, to Xi Jinping, um, but he might know about them because there is likely going to be a big propaganda push um, to push back against the peer results um, and their findings in Chinese state media. Um, so perhaps at a, at a lower level within the Communist Party, um, there's going to be some kind of response um, to the results, but you know, has it gone all the way up to the top? Well that's really anyone's guess. Mike, I just want to pick up on something that Melissa was talking about, and that's the way that uh, because we don't have any people, any Australians reporting from inside China, it's likely to um, give us a, a more hawkish view of, of China. And I've seen some other analysis which suggests that it actually strengthens the hand of the security services, mm -hmm. the, the, those people who claim to have a special knowledge about what's taking place inside China without any correspondence to provide independent balance. Do you, do you see that? Do, do, is that something we should be concerned about? No, I, I do agree with that. I mean, uh, as we know, there are still a lot of correspondence in China, but in terms of uh, there's no journalist reporting directly for Australian media organisations and, and that influences what people in Australia are, are reading or watching about China. And look, it doesn't do China any disservice either because you end up getting sort of this filtered reporting, the, the more hawkish, you know, as Melissa mentioned before, you, you end up getting sort of the more hawkish reporting on, on China, the briefings from the, the, you know, the security guys in, in Canberra, and sort of a, a generally more negative view of a country, which, as we all know, is very, very diverse, very complicated. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of great good news stories on the ground in China. I mean, there's lots of quirky, uh, colourful stories, you know, fantastic people. And so, so all those kind of stories are, are going to get lost in the mix. And, you know, you know overall, you're going to have sort of this very negative view of China. And, you know, it's such a complex country that's so difficult to understand that um, it's really important that people in Australia, that the policymakers in Canberra, you know, have, have a better understanding on how this place works. So the less journals you have on the ground, um, there's going to be less transparency and, and it's just going to make life more difficult. We're going to go to um, some questions from our audience shortly, but before we do, I just wanted to backtrack a little bit and just touch on the, the uh, question or the issue of Chang Lei, um, the Australian journalist who worked for state media, who was who is currently being held in, in a, an administrative detention, I think is the technical term for it. She's being um, accused of being, of, well, she's being held on suspicion of criminal activity endangering China's national security. Now, I guess, Sue Lin, this is really a question for you because a lot of people, a few people are drawing parallels between her situation, um, a Chinese born as um, dual national who, was working in China, who's been picked up. Do you feel that her situation is cause for concern for your own uh, for your own future if you are if, if and when you you do ultimately work in China? Yeah, I, I think that's that's a great question, and I think um, for ethnically Chinese journalists like myself who are reporting inside China, it, it is very very concerning. The way the CCP seems to, um, uh, the CCP's attitude towards ethnicity and citizenship. Um, and so I think the way the Chinese Communist Party um, views what it means to be Chinese is, is very, very different to how we in Australia, for example, view that. So um, you can look like, uh, you can, you can um, look any way and be Australian. Whereas in China, you have to look a certain way. Um, and, and so I think that that is, it's highly concerning um, for ethnically Chinese reporters. Um, but I think for all reporters, the um, detentions of the two Canadians 
um, Michael Kobrig and Michael Spavor was also very, very um, concerning for the community. Melissa, I can see you nodding there. What are your thoughts on Chiang Mai's detention? Should, should uh, is, it a, is it a message to all foreigners? Is it a particular concern to, Chinese, uh, to ethnic Chinese who might be working for, for international news organizations? I think it's a bit of both. I mean, look at the fact that Mike had to leave, right? And he's not ethnically Asian. Um, so there's that. But I, I do sense that with Cheng Lei and with the experience that I got and the treatment I got, that there was a sense of ownership over me, even though as American, there was an expectation that I should somehow be loyal to the motherland. Um, so there's that. I think with the Cheng Lei case, it's also complicated by the fact that she um, I, I think advocacy groups are in a bit of a bind because she was working for state media and a state media organization that denies the, uh, the genocide or uh, the detention of a million Uyghurs in Xinjiang, right? Um, so for advocacy purposes, you can see how a human rights organization, for example, um, who's also not happy with what's happening in Xinjiang, has, is also now in a situation where they're advocating for a staff member of, an, of a news organization that was trying to suppress that information. So that, that there's an ed, added layer of that, in addition to the fact that, you know, she is an ethnic Asian Australian, um, that I think is going to be really tricky and something that Mike said at the very beginning where he kept repeating, you know, we don't know, we don't know. Um, it, I think it's just a textbook authoritarianism in the sense that like, why did I leave? Why, why is she detained? You know, um, why are we in this situation? Why are there no Australians in, in reporters in China? And you really don't have a clear idea. It's purposeful, I think, that they, um, keep us guessing that we're really never for certain uh, what it was that motivated the decisions. Melissa, I just want to um, move to questions very briefly, but, but before I do, one last question to you on this issue. Does this place additional pressure on Chinese nationals who are working for um, foreign news organizations, those who are working as, as translators, as fixers, as local producers, and so on? Oh, 100%, absolutely. I can't imagine um, the pressure that they're under. I mean, I don't know what more to add to that. It's, it's just uh, it's just really, really hard for them. It's very dangerous. Yes, okay. Look, let's go to a few questions from our audience. Um, I've got uh, one from uh, David Tien. Um, Michael, from the hindsight, that, uh, from, from hindsight, what was your departure a knee-jerk reaction? Um, does the, should the team have stayed and taken some, some risks, do you think? Do you regret leaving? Yeah, it's a really good question. Look, I think ultimately, Bill Birders and myself were caught up in a, in a political game. I mean, it was never about a story. It was never about a story we wrote or anything we were investigating. It, it was very, very political. Um, I mean, I think the Australian government took the cautious approach, but as it was explained to us at the time, um, maybe we're being overcautious, but do you want to take the downside risk? The downside risk um, was very serious. You know, the downside risk is you, you could end up being detained. So, you know, we, as I sit here now, I'm very disappointed at having to leave. I often wonder, look, if I hadn't booked that flight, would anything have happened at all? Could I still be there working? But, um, you know, there were people in the Australian government who, who did seem very concerned about our safety. And I think I think they did the only thing they they could do, and they they decided to to take us take us out. Um, you know, maybe in in ten years I'll I'll regret leaving, but uh, look at the time it, it it was a little bit scary. Um, there's a good chance I could go back tomorrow, and and nothing would happen. But but uh, you you just don't quite know. Yeah. I, I've got another question for you, Mike, from Oliver Lees, who asked, and I think I know the answer to this, but I'll ask it anyway. Has the idea of setting up a bureau in Taiwan been floated as a kind of compromise? <laughs> well, look, we, we've been approached by the Taiwanese government already uh, to, to do that. Um, they would certainly, they're certainly welcoming journalists there with, with open arms. Look, it, it's on the list of considerations. Um, there's reasons to do it. There's, there's reasons uh, not to do it. Um, there's, there's possibly other locations uh, in Asia where, where you could cover China, there's a lot of good journalists in Australia covering China as well. So, um, look, we're not ruling that out. It, it sort of seem, seems un, unlikely at this stage, though. I've got a question for uh, Sue Lin. 
from Fenella. Um, how does the, the national security law in Hong Kong affect you as a, as a foreign correspondent covering Hong Kong and China, uh, particularly being based obviously out of Hong Kong? Are you concerned? Yes, yeah, so um, I think the national security law in Hong Kong has been immensely chilling across all as so many different aspects of Hong Kong society, um, from schools and universities and um, uh, churches and news organisations. And we saw um, a couple months ago that Apple Daily, one of the most read Hong Kong newspapers, was raided um, by hundreds of police. Um, interestingly, though, um, Jimmy Lai, um, who owns Apple Daily, um, was arrested um, under the national security law for collusion with foreign forces, but he has yet to be charged. Um, so there have been hundreds of arrests in Hong Kong um, since the national security law was introduced. Mostly the arrests were have been under um, local laws um, that are not the national security law. Um, and we've only seen um, one person charged under it. So um, it, it seems that the um, law is mostly being used by the police to intimidate and deter people um, rather than um, so far actually charge people. Um, I, I guess specifically for journalists, um, we haven't changed anything about how we've been covering Hong Kong, um, but we're obviously um, aware that there is so much uncertainty about what the national security law means. And um, that's, that's a feature, not a bug of it. Um, and that's very, it's, it's very deliberate um, by, by the Chinese Communist Party to write the law in that way. Su Lin, of course, the, the law doesn't just affect you as a reporter, it affects the people people that you're reporting on, the people that you're speaking to, the people that you're quoting, have you found that it's had a chilling effect on them? Has it been harder to, to get people to open up? Yeah, it's been shocking. Um, the change ha was literally overnight when the law was introduced on, on June 30. Um, so it used to be that if I were doing a Hong Kong politics story, I could call up five academics in the morning and get them all on the record um, saying very interesting, insightful comments. Now, most of um, my contacts, even academics, for example, will speak to me, but they'll ask to be off the record. Um, so that is much more similar to um, the situation of reporting in mainland China. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've really felt um, the, the chilling effects of the law on my contacts and sources here in Hong Kong. Um, I've got another question um, on conflating nationality and ethnicity. This is from Alan Wu. He asks, what are the considerations about the coverage of concerns regarding Chinese foreign interference? Um, while mindful not to stoke discrimination against Chinese Australians. Uh, maybe that's one I should be asking Mike. Yeah, no, that's a really important issue. And obviously I, I've only been back for a few weeks. I mean, I have a lot of uh, Australian Chinese friends here. They're, they're very concerned about this issue. There's been a, um, you know, there's been a lot of, uh, anti-Chinese sentiments since, since coronavirus. And um, look, this is having a real backlash on, uh, on the Chinese community in Australia. So I think in our journalism, we have to be very careful uh, with the way we, we're reporting on China. There's always sort of efforts to differentiate between the Communist Party and, and the Communist people. And that's always sort of been fraught with, with complications as well. So I think we have to be careful not to demonize um, China, which seems to be happening in, in some parts of the press at the moment. And, um, and, and just remember that, you know, it's, it's a nation of sort of ordinary, a uh, nation of human beings as well. I, I want to go back to, and maybe this is something for you, Melissa, I want to go back to the, the question of, of uh, Taiwan as, as an alternative. And in fact, this is a question from Drew Ambrose, who is um, another colleague of ours, of, an Al Jazeera journalist who was um, pushed out of, out of, um, uh, Malaysia recently. Um, and Drew asks, is Taipei a viable base for foreign correspondents who want to report on China but not be subject to national security laws? Do you think it is possible to get physically close to China, even though we've got the, you're obviously going to, well, China itself is, or Taiwan itself has its own very particular view of China. Is that, is that a, a workable proposition? Um. 
Before I answer that, can I quickly just add something to what Mike was saying about um, uh, foreign interference? Uh, it is definitely on Australians not to, for lack of a better word, to, to be discriminatory or racist against Chinese as a result of, 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 of the increased tension. But I also think it's also on, uh, on the Chinese government because they are very aggressive in terms of trying to recruit ethnic Chinese in the greater diaspora. And by doing so, they're, they're contributing to the problem. Um, so I think that's something that, you know, I, I don't think, I, I just worry when people rightly f feel that, you know, they really need to combat that in Australia or in the United States as Americans to combat that. But we, we need to recognize the Chinese government's contribution to making this much more difficult and much more of a dangerous situation for ethnic Chinese Australians or ethnic Chinese Canadians, Chinese Americans. So that's the, the thing. In regards to Taiwan, it's interesting that you ask the question because I'm based in Berlin and part of the time I work for uh, DW News, the German uh, news broadcaster, and they actually do not have a foothold in mainland China and um, actually have a base uh, for their East Asia base and hub in Taipei. I think it's one of the few news organizations that have done that. And I think um, it's been interesting to see the good work of the journalists based there in terms of their ability to cover China. They have managed to do an extreme amount of very good coverage for people who have not been able to step into that country. And I think it's a potential model for other news organizations to look at as they get pressure from the Chinese government or lose access to Beijing and Shanghai. Of course, I think no one will argue that um, having an actual person on the ground is invaluable, but uh, the next best thing could be uh, in Taiwan. And we do see the increasing tensions between the two sides where um, unfortunately, Taipei may be a, a newsier place to be than it has been for many, many years. But if, when you do that, you're still covering it from a place that has a really particularly jaundiced view of Beijing. You know, it's, it's, it's impossible to sit in, in somewhere like Taipei without absorbing at least some of the political culture and the political attitudes towards China. And doesn't that automatically set you up to take a hostile view of Beijing? And I, I think that's a really good point. And I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I think, um, you know, far too few people have spent time in Taipei to feel the mortal peril you know, of, of being there and what it's like to be on the front line. So that things like Hong Kong came as a surprise to most people when, when I would argue that perhaps it shouldn't have. There were a lot of clues, frankly, over the last 10, 20 years. And there are now some people coming out to argue that the Chinese position has not really shifted under Xi Jinping, but the strategy has been fairly consistent after all uh, these past 20 years. We talk about the decoupling that the United States is doing right now. Um, and you can see that with WeChat and TikTok, but you know, it was when I was in China very long ago at this point that the Chinese decoupled from Google and blocked it out, uh, blocked Twitter, blocked LinkedIn, blocked uh, Instagram, blocked Snapchat uh, later on. And so China has been decoupling for a very long time. They just didn't announce it. So you can see all these examples where I think that uh, it wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing to be in Taiwan and be in that headspace to know what that real threat is. So Lynn, would you ever consider locating or basing yourself out of Taiwan if you couldn't make it into the mainland China? Yes, yeah, I would, I would consider that. Um, we have a lot of peers um, who are currently in Taiwan because they cannot make it into the mainland. So quite a few of New York Times journalists um, are there right now. Obviously, there, um, the, the challenges posed by being in Taiwan are somewhat similar to the challenges posed by being in Hong Kong. There, there are certain stories that you will just be unable to do because you, you, they, you, they require you being on the ground in mainland China. Um, I've got another question, I think, also for, for you, Sue Lin. This one's from Yasmin. Um, and she asks, what's, what's your view of the future of foreign correspondence in China and Hong Kong? Um, ultimately, given the way, given the trajectory that we've been talking about, the increasing the authoritarian um, approach from Beijing, the obvious lack of any tolerance for dissent, uh, those who remain will only, uh, will they be the ones who will be willing to toe the party line or, or is there a future for, for genuinely independent critical reporting? I think for most foreign correspondents in China right now, um, 
if you suggested they were towing the party line, um, I, I, I think they, they would push back on that. So I think people are still trying to do independent reporting. It is getting much, much harder. Um, one of my friends who covers the Chinese economy was just telling me the other day, she tried to do a story on consumer inflation and went down to her local supermarket and no one would go on the record about the price of apples. So yes, it's getting much, much harder now. Um, but I think China is one of the stories of our times and it's so important and interesting. Um, and so, I mean, there are hundreds of journalists in China right now, as we mentioned earlier on, and, and I think people will, will try and continue to report from there um, for as long as they're able to. I mean, obviously um, people have been, journalists have been getting expelled this year. So if, if you're expelled, um, it, you can't continue on in China as a foreign correspondent. Mike, would you be willing to, I mean, you're, you're, you're still keen to go back, I take it. Do you see that that's a vital prospect, given, particularly given the trends we've been talking about? Yeah, look, I mean, in terms of me going back, it's a very, you know, I can't see that happening in certainly not, not this year. I mean, I don't know if the Australian government would, would let me off after sort of um, urging me to leave. You know, we don't know whether the Chinese authorities would, would, would let me back. But, but all that aside, yeah, the challenges of reporting in China, and as Su Lin sort of highlighted uh, before, it's now happening in Hong Kong, but this idea that your contacts won't speak to you. I mean, we, we saw over the last 18 months sort of economists and, and people in the finance sector who have been talking to my newspaper for 10 years, they suddenly clamped up and just said, look, we're not allowed to talk to you anymore. Um, and look, I, I had this case back in May, the schools in Shanghai were reopening. We went out to the school gates. Um, we interviewed a whole bunch of parents about how they felt about their kids going back to school after, after COVID. It was going to be a really positive story. They were pretty happy with the way the government managed it. But, but that night, all these parents started calling us and um, they'd basically been identified on the cameras outside the school, tracked down, and they were, they were warned you know, not to speak to foreign journalists. They, they said if we use their quotes in the story, they, they would get into trouble or their kids could get kicked out of school. So we had to pull the story. So, you know, that sort of demonstrates the, the, the challenges about just getting anyone to, to speak to you uh, in China, which, which makes reporting there on the ground also much harder. Well, this, is, this leads me to, I think, what is probably going to be our final question. And I'm going to actually put this to each of you as a way of wrapping up. A very forward-looking question from Olivia. And she's asking, what do you think practicing journalism in and on China is going to look like in 2030, in 10 years' time? And how can we ensure that it's able to be done? Mike, what do you think? <laughs> Crystal ball. Oh, that's a big, that's a big question. I mean, I'd, I'd like to think there were, there were still going to be foreign correspondents in China, that there's a chance there won't be any. Um, I mean, China may get to the point where it feels it, it just doesn't need us in it anymore. It can distribute its, its message on, on Twitter, etc. But uh, look, I really hope not. Um, you know, with technology, there, there's, there's always ways to communicate with, with people in China, even if the reporting's done outside of China, the, you know, there's always people inside the country you can speak to. So, you know, I really hope it continues. Melissa, um, you've had the probably the longest experience of, of any of the journalists here. Um, looking again, look, looking into your crystal ball, what do you see for, for 10 years on? Um, I'm not sure in terms of the number of foreign correspondents that would be in China, that'll be hard. What I do know is that really good reporting in China will continue. I started um, this panel by talking about the reality of self-censorship. Perhaps a better word is just calculus. Um, it's not uh, censoring, but making a decision of when you do stories um, and, um, you know, um, doing one story over another and doing the more sensitive story later. And what I mean by that, sorry, that was very jumbled, but I guess my point is that as the pressure has mounted in the Chinese government against the foreign press corps, uh, we have seen phenomenal reporting on Xinjiang, right? So it, it's not as if, um, the content on China has has been held back in any way. I mean, um, there's been massive investigations over the last decade, even as it's tightened um, in terms of the pressure on foreign correspondents. So I do think that really, really great reporting will continue. Um, and everyone still makes that calculus, but the overall contribution is 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 really good stuff on China. 
So then I'm going to give you the last word, particularly as you represent, really, as, as I mentioned at the outset, the, the future. Um, do you see yourself still in Beijing in 10 years' time, operating freely? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I'll still be in Beijing in 10 years' time, uh, but if, if I were, I, I hope I um, would be operating freely. Um, I guess to the broader question, yes, I, I'd like to echo what Melissa just said. I think we have seen some extraordinary journalism come out of China by foreign correspondents. Um, particularly on Xinjiang, but on a whole wide range of issues. And unfortunately, considering the constraints that local Chinese journalists are under, um, but for foreign correspondents, those kinds of stories would just never see the light of day. So, so I really, truly hope that by in 2030, we will still have excellent journalism coming out of China, um, hopefully by both foreign correspondents and local journalists. But um, uh, it's yeah very, very hard to predict what's going to happen even say next year, let alone by 2030. And then the, the only other thing I would add is I think um, a lot of news organizations over the past few years have um, created positions um, of China in the world correspondents. So The Economist has um, a China correspondent in New York who looks at um, stories about China connected to China overseas and I think we're going to see more and more of those kinds of correspondence with those kinds of beats um, and that's going to grow increasingly important as China um, has more and more of a presence around the whole world. Of course that is exactly what Melissa has been doing for the past few years. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen thank you very much Sue Lin, Mike Smith, Melissa Chan, um, thank you to everybody this was an absolutely wonderful conversation um, thank you again to all for, for your contributions. Thank you to the Asia Society for hosting this alongside my organization, the Alliance for Journalist Freedom.